back a few years ago, the chattering classes just could not stop talking about this book, Shop Class as Soulcraft. Now, Matthew Crawford got his PhD in political philosophy, but he traded working at a think tank in order to open up his own motorcycle repair shop. And in this bestseller, he lays out the case for why that's actually more satisfying mental labor. Crawford's arguments in this book about the cognitive demands of manual work seemed provocative in 2009. But as he occasionally acknowledges, these claims have a much longer lineage. Now, manual training and its cousin vocational education were key to institutionalizing the high school, to taking it from something that only about 4% of American students graduated from, and those 4% mostly were going to college, to something today that graduates something close to 90% of American students. In this module, we're going to explore these conflicts and debates about vocational education and how it became integral to the American Comprehensive High School. Now, after the American Civil War, manual training became the hot new thing among many American education reformers. And its influences were very similar to the influences that gave us the kindergarten. It was this idea that book learning was too dull and that object learning, that learning through manual touch and feel and observation was the key to unlocking the potential in young people's minds. In the words of one education historian, manual training used the hands to discipline the mind. But unlike kindergartens, which were by and large popular with middle class and often women reformers, manual training and vocational education really struck a chord with male industrialists who thought that they could use this sort of training in order to create better workers for their factories. Many school administrators, on the other hand, liked the idea of manual training and vocational education because it might bump up the numbers of people attending high school, up from that number in those low percentages between 2 and 6 percent across the United States, to something that could become more like the common school, something where almost everyone in a society, almost everyone in a community would attend. Now, an early example of the manual training fad was the craze for industrial drawing. Many businessmen poured in funding and thought they might manufacture great new skilled workers. Francis Lowell, a Massachusetts cotton textile factory owner, petitioned the state legislature in 1869 for drawing classes on the grounds that otherwise Massachusetts would fall dramatically behind its European counterparts. It will be impossible, he argued, for Massachusetts long to maintain any eminence in the higher manufacturers if the great body of workmen of other countries are the superiors to our own in the arts of design, in the drafting of machinery, and in the habits of observation from such accomplishments. In response, state legislation soon forced towns and cities above 10,000 Massachusetts to offer free industrial drawing classes. But the results were disappointing and the fad soon waned. This went on with other skills like sewing, cooking, woodworking. But the same process tended to happen. Bold promises of this new training producing great, highly skilled new workers would peter out. And in their place, educators would uh, instead substitute the argument that these skills were just great training for workers in general. Instead, educators promoted the values that it would teach time management, work discipline, how to keep your mind from wandering on boring and rote tasks. That was the value of manual training. By the way, if there's one thing that we're really good at in school systems, it's rationalizing that what we do matters not for the content, but for the values and the process. And in this instance, perhaps unsurprisingly, Educators and industrialists agreed that there was one group of people that particularly could use the values that came from industrial education, and that was the poor. Poor immigrants, poor mill workers, poor African Americans. Those were the folks who needed that work discipline that was instilled through industrial education. Now, not everyone was satisfied with this kind of general vocational education. The National Association of Manufacturers, for instance, 
argued in 1905 that this was too rote, too, becoming too book-based, much like all these other sorts of fads and crazes have become. What they wanted to do was reinvigorate the system with something closer to what was going on in Germany, where you had these schools set up to teach adolescents specific trades, specific skills, take them out of the same school system where the college educated were getting their educations and go into these trade schools. Some educators, meanwhile, pointed out that the dropout rate was still enormous despite compulsory education laws that were already on the books in many states. Such criticisms were crystallized in the Douglas Commission report of Massachusetts in 1906. And even though it was a report specifically for Massachusetts, it was a nationally important clarion call for schools to teach industrial intelligence and to teach that mental power to see beyond the task which occupies the hand for the moment to the operations which have preceded it and those that will follow it. Phrases that sound an awful lot like what you will find in Matthew Crawford's book. The Douglas Commission report brought together a whole host of folks, business, labor, educators, farmers, child welfare advocates, social settlement workers, all of whom formed this particular lobbying group, the National Society for the Promotion of Industrial Education. Eventually, that group persuaded Congress to pass the Smith-Hughes Act of 1917, which became a vehicle to promote vocational education across the states. Now, this is not all to say that the National Association of Manufacturers was completely successful in promoting its vision for, for, what, for what vocational education should be. For instance, if we had heeded that report, we would have ended up with these separate schools, like in Germany. But most American educators, and the voters and politicians who backed them, were uncomfortable with the anti-democratic implications of such a system. They worried that such a system might lock people in too young to a, an identity as worker, that it might violate the basic idea, this fundamental belief in America, that you can be anything you want, this American dream. This was a debate that was going on in communities across the country, not only about black education, but about the purpose of public secondary schooling writ large. The debate was resolved, or at least a non-aggression pact was reached, with the 1918 Cardinal Principles of Education report, issued as part of a committee that was put together by the National Education Association. Education historians have debated whether this was a total triumph of a cold, calculating, ruthlessly efficient set of bureaucrats, or just a partial victory for them, with some silver lining for more John Dewey-inspired progressive educators who were small-d Democrats. But the Cardinal Principles report did say that it was okay if tracking did occur in high school, if there was a kind of separate path for vocational students than from college-bound students, as long as they were both together in the same institution, as long as they were together in the same high school. In other words, it wasn't okay that you would have the sort of trade schools that you had in Europe. With the comprehensive high school institutionalized after the Cardinal Principles Report in 1918, attendance rates started to soar. They rose from 4% in 1890 to about 24% by 1920, and by the end of the 1930s, that had bumped all the way up to about 50%. In the post-war period, the civil rights movement and the push for racial equality was able to push that up to universal levels for high school attendance. And again, we're at the point now where we're reaching nearly universal levels for high school graduation. For this attendance explosion, we should give a lot of credit to the vocational education for making the people's college, as high school has often been called by education historians, into something more than just a prep school. Yet we should not let our enthusiasm for the increases in access to high school cover up the many inequalities still embedded in this American education system. What good did all this extra attendance do for America? We'll take up this question of economic growth, these questions of inequalities, in our next video on the American Comprehensive High School.